Hi, Al. Um, could you introduce yourself to us? Oh, sure. I'm uh, Al Montanero, and uh, I teach in the Department of Communication. The department I used to, uh, and I'm retired now, so I don't chair anything. What was your role in the military? In, in the military? Oh, in the military. Oh, uh, instructor. Oh. Um, and uh, where were you born? In, uh, see, born, I was born in New York, a little downstate town. And uh, then moved to Illinois and, um, in, in Illinois. Illinois is what I really call home because that's where I was uh, old enough now that I could learn my own way. Uh, but I was, I was born here in New York State. So what was the path? What was your path like to joining the service? Well, um, I couldn't get a job at uh, General Electric, which is what all of us did in those days, uh, or in Ralston Pro Purina. Uh, so I figured I had to do something to earn my own way. Uh, and uh, wanted to go to college, but uh, my father was uh, old country Italian, and and thought that I ought to develop the muscles in my arm, not in my head, so uh, he wasn't going to pay for my going to college at all. Uh, and um, I went to college in, um, oh, I forgot what year now, 19, uh, 1959, I think, I started college. And I was, uh, I was about 27 at the time. I spent six years in military, yeah, in the Air Force, yeah, and um, when I got out I had the GI Bill, and uh, it's what I went in service for anyway, it was the GI Bill, which is why I went six years in, in service, uh, and get, to get a, full load, uh, the, uh, a full load for uh, GI Bill. Uh, and I started in my schooling in Southern Illinois University uh, in Carbondale, Illinois. What year did you enter the, the service? You said you, your education was 1959. Oh, ni mm, ni 1953 or 1954, I think. 54, I think. Um, you said the... Uh, the GI Bill. Just, yeah. Um, could you tell us what that is? Well, uh, the GI Bill is uh, uh, had been legislated at the end of the Second World War and was still in force uh, when the Korean War broke out. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not a Korean War. It's a Korean, uh, it's a Korean police action. All right, uh, and uh, it was uh, never. It was uh, never taken out of uh, out of law. So, what the GI Bill was, you had your choice of what you wanted to do after you got out of service, um, and you could use the uh, GI Bill money that you would get. There was it, that was always uh, pretty much a guarantee that you'd get the GI Bill, and some some folks uh, used the GI Bill uh, privilege to. Put a down payment on a house, uh, as most of us, I think, I don't know for sure, but many of us, myself included, I used it for my education. Because so I knew without it I wouldn't get an education. So that was one of the motivators for you joining the service. What were some of the others? The one? Some of the other motivators for you joining oh, the service. That was it. Okay. That was it. Well, I know I had some friends going in, and we went in with a, we went in a, as a group. Okay. Uh, so I guess you could call that a motivator too. That some of my friends were going in. I figured, what the hell, uh, and went in myself. 
awesome. Um, did you uh, pick the Air Force? I mean, why did you pick the Air Force? Oh, I, well, I picked the Air Force because um, it, 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 it was safer, in my judgment, than going in the, the Marines or the Army. And uh, I didn't care much for the Navy. I don't know why, but I didn't just, just didn't care much for the Navy. Um, what, um, what was your occupation? What did you do in the Air Force? In the Air Force? Yeah. I, I was uh, a drill instructor. I went uh, four months to tech school, GIS, General Instructor School. And uh, when I got out, I was qualified then to, uh, to take care of uh, uh, 90 men in a barracks. Which is what I, uh, which is what I did, um, and take them out and drill them, and keep them in line and things of that nature. Uh, smoking wasn't allowed in the barracks, and so, you know, that was always a reason, always a reason, why I had to discipline some of the the guys in the barrack because they would smoke in the barrack. Um. Where did you attend basic training? In? Um, Lackland Air Force Base in Texas, San Antonio, Texas. And did you did you choose the path of being um, a drill instructor, or was that something the military assigned you? No, that's that's where the, the in the military you don't have many choices, and one of those choices that you don't have is what you're going to do for the next three or four years or six years in my case. Um, and we take these aptitude tests, uh, and based on the information from the aptitude tests, they tell us where we're going. And I was I was selected for general instructor school, uh, which I think is probably better than uh, be becoming a cook or something like that in service. So. As a drill instructor, um, did you work with any specific, like, sort of um, Air Force, like, troop? I mean, was it like, did you train for a specific thing, or were you just, like, a drill instructor? No, I was a drill instructor for, oh, I think for my first, my first three years I was a drill instructor. And then, um, then the, um, the war was over, and uh, we were lightening up or um, what do they call it now, a downsizing uh, uh, the military and they didn't need as many drill instructors as they had uh, so I was assigned, I, I still had a, uh, a specialty code of uh, education which is a 75 code, you wouldn't know anything about that anyway but um, I, was, I was still uh, a, an academic instructor then and I was assigned to uh, various places on AIH uh, uh, for the in, uh, Airman's Information Hour. And I would go TDY, uh, temporary duty, uh, to various places and show a bunch of films and, uh, and uh, generally to, uh, uh, to brush them up on their military um, uh, traditions and, and, uh, and customs and courtesies and, and things like that uh, to keep their, their education up on what the Air Force is. We educated them about the Air Force period, you know. We, it wasn't uh, math or science or uh, writing even, it was about the Air Force. And my specialty as an academic instructor was Air Force history. So I would take films around uh, and uh, uh, run the films and talk about the history of the Air Force uh, from Hap Arnold up to the present day, which at that time was uh, Roger LeMay. So you, is that the last um, like job that you had in the Air Force that carried you through to the end of yeah, the service? Yeah, that's, that's what I did until until I was separated. Okay. Um, and where were you 
stationed in both of these cases? I know you were on temporary duty in one, so that moved you around, but what was Well, your... my, my home base was uh, Scott Air Force Base in Belleville, Illinois, which is uh, in western Illinois, right there on the uh, Missouri border. So uh, at that time I was part Missourian and part Illinois. Yeah, it's usually more fun in St. Louis than. Uh, at, at any rate, that was my that was my uh, my home base, and then I would go out to wherever they would send me to uh, to run my film and do my shtick. Uh, what was life like living on the base in uh, where you were? Oh, it wasn't it wasn't bad. Uh, it, it's a lot it's a lot better than probably many people imagine. I guess the the only thing that you miss is is an opportunity for personal privacy. I mean, yeah, not even a, a DI uh, or an academic instructor had his personal privacy. <clears throat> uh, but basically, uh, it, it was a, a pretty easy life, really. Uh, and part of the game was getting away with what you could get away with. Uh, in service, and I lined up with a bunch of guys and knew how to get away with a lot of stuff, uh, and, and we did. If we, if we wanted to paint our our barrack rooms, uh, we would go out and steal the paint and bring it back and paint it up, and then uh, in, uh, if we didn't get caught, and I met some interesting people. As a matter of fact. Uh, my best friend when I was in uh, in service is still a good friend of mine. He's uh, retired from the law. He was a lawyer, not while he was in service, but he became a lawyer later, a patent lawyer in D.C. And now he's retired and moved to Colorado. Uh, that was his uh, his his base of operations, at Lowry Air Force Base in uh, Denver. Um, no, it wasn't. No, I take that back. He eventually ended up there, but at first it was Chinook Air Force Base in Illinois. And Chinook was closer to Chicago, and that was the only uh, advantage uh, he had. But we, we kept in touch with one another, and we would do, you know, we were prankster, uh, pranksters and, and did strange things. Uh, and since we were in charge of barracks, uh, we were in a position to do strange things. Uh, we uh, would do, sometimes we would be the, uh, the person in charge of a squadron uh, in the evening, all through the night. Uh, that was a duty that you had to, uh, uh, that you had to perform. Uh, and in that position, uh, you were the boss of the squadron, and that's when we had a, a better opportunity for uh, pulling crap. Uh, we invented a person, George Ralfovich, uh, and uh, uh, between Herb and I, we had him put up for uh, Airman of the Week or Airman of the Month, and he would always win that. Um, and he didn't exist. Uh, we, we got called down on that when uh, he was going to be offered a raise. Uh, and a promotion, and we had to admit, no, 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 there is no George Ralfovich. <laughs> How did that go over? Uh, not too good, not <laughs> too good. No, we got uh, what were known in those days as an Article 15, uh, which is uh, you know, like a misdemeanor uh, uh, charge, and we didn't go to jail or anything, but we had, uh, we had, we were fined, uh, and uh, we were confined to um, our barracks for a month, uh, which was okay because our only job was flying around and showing these films anyway. And so you uh, said you did a lot of that sort of mischief stuff. What else did you do? Mm -hmm. Well, I spent some time <clears throat> trying to be an instructor of cryptography. Now, I wasn't trained in cryptography. I was trained as a teacher. But uh, in the Air Force, 
if you're trained to be a teacher, you should be able to teach anything once you familiarize yourself with it. But um, I didn't get familiarized enough with cryptography to become a cryptographic cryptography teacher. So I had to go back to being a, an academic and making those those flights. So, um, just so we know, um, the like the specific job that you had in your platoon was drill instructor, um, and it was. Uh, did you have a platoon number or like a platoon designation? Oh yeah, thirty six fifty seven. Okay. That was our platoon number, thirty six fifty seven. I don't know if the n the number didn't mean anything to me except that thirty uh, thirty six fifty seven uh, was in the H area, which is uh, one of those areas where uh, not just a, a a platoon but a whole a whole flight uh, would be there and there will be several barracks in each of the areas and uh, and different flights of young airmen um, that we had to deal with uh, all in in one area so um, well that's that's the way it worked okay um, what was it like living in uh the town that you're living in. I mean, wh how, what were the interactions like between the servicemen and the civilians? Not always. Uh, oh, oh, and civilians? And civilians, yeah. Oh, not always very good. Not always very good. I remember uh, very well being thrown through a plate glass window when I upset a gyrene. And uh, he was really upset. And it, this was at a bar. Uh, in Geneva, New York, and he uh, got very upset, and we pushed, I pushed, he pushed, then he decided he was going to do more than push and threw me through a plate glass window. Yeah, I still got the scars. What, uh, what spurred the fight? What brought it on? Anything in particular, or? Oh, yeah, that, it, it's, uh, uh, an intra-military rivalry and back then nobody liked the gyrenes except the gyrenes and uh, that's why we called them gyrenes I don't know why gyrenes but um, marines just you know, they didn't have their own they weren't their own service they were part of the Navy and still are they're part of the Navy and um, we were, before I joined, uh, we were part of the Army, the Army Air Corps, until uh, Congress decided to split us off and make us the United States Air Force. Uh, and that was, oh, maybe six years before I joined, so uh, that's, that's what it was, the Air Force, when I joined. Okay. Um, so you say there was like a rivalry uh, between the Marines and the Air Force. Um, oh, usually it was didn't have to be Marines, could be uh, Army, uh, but when you're when you're drinking, you you pick on anything you can. Mm -hmm. So, what was it like living um, in that community, even though you're on the base? Uh, it really it wasn't too bad um, once you get used to it, but you do have to get used to it. I mean, uh, each base is like a city. It has its own theaters, it has its own library. Uh, the only difference is uh, most of the space is for uh, is for living quarters, barracks, uh, and mess halls, and executive offices of the, for the officers. <coughs> so, uh, you know, most of the bases were like that. The basic bases. The basic bases are uh, Airman Basic is brand new recruit. All right, and that's what I worked with during the first three years in, in service. And that's when I was a DEI. And they had a um, an additional area uh, for for training. And we didn't we didn't run the training that experts in, in certain areas 
uh, of expertise uh, uh, ran that, but uh, it's what we called bivouac. And we would go out and we would live in the rough in tents uh, and, and stuff like that. We'd dig foxholes and get ready for war in case we ever got into one. Uh, at the time we were in one, so. Um, but Air Force wasn't very big on uh, going to um, war as soldiers because we, unless we were, uh, uh, unless we were officers, um, we were support people like academics and drill instructors. Uh, the pilots uh, were all officers and it's the pilots who did the, who did the fighting. I'm probably one of the last to have seen what was one, at one time uh, the, the pride of the Air Force, the, the infamous Sabre Jet. Uh, and F, oh man, what was it? An F-76 F or uh, an F-96, I forgot, but it was, it was, the nickname was the Sabre Jet. It was fast and, and, and uh, moved very well in the air. Um, did you, did you serve um, stateside, like exclusively? Or? Yeah, um, I was always based stateside. But I didn't always stay Bayside because of the kind of work I did. Uh, I was, um, and for some reason they had me pegged for a northern person. So uh, I went to Goose Bay, Labrador, which is up off Canada, uh, and went to uh, Thule, Greenland, uh, where we were told there's a girl behind every tree. And when you get up there, you find out why because there are no trees. Uh, and uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, and Seoul, Korea, and, uh, and once I went to England for a short time, uh, station, not stationed there, I was TDY again. Like I said, I had one base, Scott Air Force Base, and then from there I would be TDY, which is temporary duty, I was TDY someplace for maybe a month, maybe two months uh, at a time. But when I was done with my uh, job wherever I was, uh, then I was flown back to uh, Scott Air Force Base. And you said you were in Korea. Were you in Seoul at the same time as the, um, the police action was going on? Uh, yeah, yeah. And that was kind of scary. I mean, that was really scary. Um, I was stationed at, uh, not stationed again, TDY, at Kimpo, Kimpo Air Force Base, or Air Force, yeah, Air Force Base, which is just a little north of Seoul. Uh, and I happened to be there when the North Koreans thought that they could overrun Seoul and came right through Kimpo uh, to do that. And that's as close as I ever came in service to being killed. Um, and it, it, it wasn't fun. It wasn't exciting, you know. Um, when we were kids, we used to play war. Yeah, it wasn't like that at all. And I, 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 I lucked out. I, uh, I, I was um, not armed on purpose because I was there at TDY. And uh, <clears throat> so I wasn't, I, I, I wasn't armed myself. Uh, but I was I was given an M1 rifle, M1 rifles, a lot smaller. It's a carbine actually, rather than a rifle. And uh, if you see anybody that, uh, with the instruction, you see anybody that looks like they're attacking us, shoot them. That's that. That's about it. And uh, I don't think I killed anybody. I don't think anybody was in trouble because of me. <clears throat> and. Uh, I got I got hit in the head um, by a bullet, uh, but uh, it it was a, a, a glancing blow, and I was sent to Tokyo to recover, which wasn't bad. Tokyo was nice in those days, uh, and then sent home. Uh, 
to Scott. What what was going through your mind during the um, the attempted overtaking of Kimpo Air Force Base? What was what where? was going through your mind at Kimpo? Yeah, the night we got raided. Uh, holy shit! I didn't join up for this. Is what was going through my mind because we were for the most part non-combatant and we were educators and we were academics uh, and we weren't supposed to be seeing any action and I wasn't, I wasn't there I just happened to be there uh, as the AIH officer or NCO <clears throat> and showing my films and it just happened while I was TDY there uh, that we got raided it was a surprise to everybody who was there, too, uh, that we got raided. So, you, um, you were able to recover in Tokyo. You want to oh, talk yeah. about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't serious. Um, but it, it, it was a head wound, and even a scratch on the head is... Uh, serious enough to give you to, to get you put into a, a vet ho uh, not a vet hospital but a, uh, um, in in Tokyo I was sent to a Navy hospital. Okay, um, just um, to go back for a moment, the men who you were training as a drill instructor, what were their roles going to be? Um, not uh, to uh, to. Uh, the train 90 men. That was it. To train them in customs and courtesies of the Air Force, uh, to train them in drill, uh, to uh, get them through bivouac, uh, and not to make fighting machines out of them or anything like that, uh, but uh, uh, good airmen uh, who could do a lot of things, mostly office work, I think the only dangerous job in the Air Force at that time uh, was uh, uh, being uh, in the Air Police, uh, the military uh, Air Police, which I, I escaped by going to GIS, like I said, and becoming an instructor. Uh, but, you know, that we were in charge of the discipline of 90 human beings in our barrack. Uh, for a total of 54 weeks at a time. So 54 weeks of training, uh, and training, new, new flight comes in. And 54 more weeks, and the new flight comes in. So training was over a year long. Oh, no, no, not 54 weeks, I'm sorry. 54 days. Um, and they were just going to be airmen um, in whatever function the Air Force wanted? Yeah. Okay. Um, so everyone has some positive and negative experiences. What were some of your most memorable experiences in the Air Force? My mo I, being honest, um, I think my memorable, my most memorable experiences when uh, Herb Cantor and I were playing around and playing games with the, it's all, when you're in service and you're only a uh, an airman and not an officer. Uh, it's more fun to uh, uh, play around, um, just to be able to get away with it. You know, you know, like answering the phone and uh, and calling, you know, uh, speaking badly to the person, and the person saying, "Well, you know who this is. This is Colonel So and So." And I said, "Well, big deal." You know who I am? No? Good. No, no. We would do things like that. Not that, not very often, but we did have, um, Herb was Jewish. And so Herb wasn't going to get any leave time for Christmas because he was Jewish. And uh, I wasn't Jewish at the time, but uh, with her at that time, I felt kind of Jewish. I felt with her, you know, he's, I, I'm, I'm, I've got an opportunity to get off base, and he doesn't. 
so what we did is we went to uh, uh, a Colonel uh, Boys. Uh, he was uh, not the wing commander, but he was uh, the squadron commander uh, for for our flights. And we cut down a, a, a fir tree from in front of his house, uh, which was on base, and his house wasn't really a house. It was, it was where he lived while he was on base. Um, we, we cut it down and brought it back to our barrack and, and set it up in the barrack in a, uh, in, in a bucket of sand and then uh, decorated it uh, and, and with whatever we had there and, um, and called it a Hanukkah bush. And that's where uh, all, the, all the troops who were Jewish, we introduced the Hanukkah bush. Uh, to them, and this was all you know. This is all Herb's idea. It wasn't mine. I just go along with Herb most of the time. Um, I want to come back to some of the stuff that you did, but in the meantime, um, you said that you were wounded. So I assume you got a Purple Heart. No. No. What's, no. Did you earn any? You you, uh, uh, you only get a Purple Heart if you're wounded uh, disablingly. And I wasn't really disabled. You know, uh, as a matter of fact, I didn't even need to go to a hospital, as it turned out. Uh, it's just SAP, what they, um, that, that's the way things are done. You, you get any wound, you go to a, a hospital. Sometimes it's a MASH unit uh, if it needs surgery, and sometimes it's out of here. Uh, but you go to a hospital, it's for observation. And it was determined that I wasn't, I wasn't going to die from my wound. It was just a, a, a bullet that came into my helmet and went around and around in my helmet and occasionally uh, touched my skull and burned me. So that's really all it was, just a burn. Um, did you earn, well, what was your rank at the time? Uh, at what time? Well, from the beginning to the end of your service, I guess. Well, from the beginning, I, I came in like everybody else in Airman Basic. That is no stripe at all. And then you get to be uh, a one striper uh, for um, a uh, third class, Airman third class. Two stripes is an Airman second class, or was then anyway. And uh, three stripes is a first class uh, Airman or sergeant. And if you get three stripes and a rocker, that's the little loop under uh, under the stripes. Uh, you're a staff sergeant. That's as far as I got with staff sergeant. Then there were there are two, three uh, grades after that, after staff sergeant. There's technical sergeant, which is five stripes altogether, and master sergeant, which is six stripes. And uh, then first uh, first soldier, what they call the first soldier, first sergeant. And he had uh, the, the, the six stripes and a diamond in the middle of it. And he, he, that meant that he was, he was in charge of a, of a squadron. He, like, uh, he's as close as you can get to being an officer in, um, in service, or in the Air Force anyway. Um, so did you... Did you earn any um, like commendations or any awards or anything during your service? Awards? Um, yeah, aside from being promoted, of course. No, no. Uh, and where we were, uh, you tried to avoid them as much as possible. And we successfully avoided them. Um, but everybody back then, if you were joined, if you joined while the war was still going on, uh, you got uh, w what we called a, uh, well, uh, what's that gum that... Mm. Bazooka. Hmm? Bazooka. Like no, but it, it's a little ribbon uh, like that, and we call a dentine. Oh. And we called it our, our dentine uh, wrapper. <laughs> uh, it was a national defense ribbon. 
and everybody got one. I mean, that wasn't for anything you did or didn't do. You just joined, and you got a national defense, because there was a war going on, it was a national defense uh, ribbon. Um, so you served a total of uh, six years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what were some of the, um, the high and low points of that time? Like The highest and low points? Yeah, some of the... Personally or in the Air Force? Whatever you'd like to share. Oh, well, um, the low point for me uh, was being a, a basic airman. In other words, going through, going through basic training, uh, which is what later I was part of, basic training. Uh, but it, it really is, uh, it's like, you know, hell night for 54 days, uh, being an airman basic and uh, a new recruit. Uh, because everybody you come up uh, with, like the DEI, and, uh, they know that you're nothing, uh, that you're just a basic and you don't know crap about the, uh, about the Air Force yet. So that was the low point. Um, what were uh, some of the high, the other, well, high points? You've mentioned a oh. couple, but. Well, the high point for me uh, was uh, being um, assigned TDY uh, to England because uh, of the places I've been going, you know, like Goose Bay and, and Thule, Greenland and Fairbanks, Alaska. And it was the first time I wasn't up in a uh, in, in, in a snow belt. Uh, and not only that, you know, in England they speak English like I do. Uh, well, no, not like I do, but they speak English so I can understand them. Uh, and uh, I, I got a chance to uh, go to Paris uh, when I was there. Uh, my time, um, we had three-day passes uh, over a weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, and sometimes we get a little longer than that, um, almost like a leave length. And we would do things like uh, go to the mainland. And uh, personally, I like I like Paris. Uh, some of the guys um, like the Netherlands better uh, and, uh, and Denmark. Uh, where things were a, little, a bit looser, sexually speaking. <laughs> um, I think we're going to pause on this one because we need to change the tape. Okay, thanks, Al. Um, so, you mentioned some of your high and low points. Um, what? No, I'm Oh, okay. I'm My high point was um, uh, being discharged because <laughs> uh, when I was discharged, since I was right there in Illinois, um, I just went over to uh, to St. Louis and set up housekeeping in St. Louis, and I was um, I was uh, discharged during the summer. And so I was thinking in terms of uh, beginning college uh, in the fall, like everybody else. Uh, I was at first going to go to St. Louis University, um, but they were very expensive. It's a private school, and uh, that was before there was a University of Missouri at St. Louis, which is a lot cheaper. So I used my uh, my my. Uh, Illinois residency and uh, went to Southern Illinois. Uh, instead, I, I'm glad I did because I met some really important people that I didn't know were important at that time, but it taught me one thing uh, about going to college. You don't go to a college because of its reputation. You go to a college to study with somebody, somebody who has a reputation, and uh, you know, that's what I did. Uh, I was um, uh, a student of, uh, of R. Buckminster Fuller, and uh, uh, that, that's, that's what 
persuaded me that you don't go to college for the college, you go to college uh, for the academics. Now, Bucky was, was a little different. He didn't have a PhD, didn't have a master's degree, he was an architect uh, and a writer and a philosopher uh, and a whole lot of things. And when I took his course, it was a philosophy course uh, and it was enjoyable and Bucky was a character. And that's always fun to have, to have class with a character. Uh, I tried to model myself after Bucky, but you know, yeah, that, that's, not, that's not going to happen. I'll never get as important as, as Bucky was. Um, and then I, uh, I went to Michigan State to study with uh, Samuel Hayakawa, who was uh, a um, linguist, uh, and a uh, semanticist of the day, very popular, very uh, well known as a matter of fact. Uh, during the 60s, he was uh, the president of San Francisco uh, State. Uh, and he, he got bombed and everything uh, when the student riots uh, started in the 60s. Um, so I, I, in general, uh, I went to study with people that I knew were very good and had a reputation for being very good, and I never was disappointed. I, every place I went for a per particular person, that person was everything that he was supposed to be, at least in my, in my judgment. Uh, and I was, uh, you know, thrilled to, to be learning at his feet. That was great. Uh, and today I think, you know, students just see college as a hurdle. And I don't give a damn who's here, I just want to get over this hurdle. I just want to get my 121 hours and get out of here. Either go into business or go to a master's degree. But it was different uh, back in the 60s. A lot different back in the 60s. I'll tell you one thing I didn't do back in the 60s. I didn't go to San Francisco. Uh, I had no interest in Haight-Ashbury at all, uh, which is where the counter, uh, the, the counter revolution was going on, of course. Um, I just wanted to get an education and get a job somewhere. So what was the uh, transition from going from the service to the outside? What was that like? Um, it was, uh, yeah, it, it, it was a little troubling at first because remember uh, I was six years uh, being told what to do and following orders and things like that. And when you get out, that's the first thing you notice. That there's nobody telling you what to do. Uh, and so I wasted about a year, you know, just doing very, very little and, and getting away with everything that I could, just like I was in service. Uh, but uh, it, it took me a year before I realized that, you know, you, you start trying to get away from uh, everything you're supposed to be doing. Uh, and you're not hurting anybody but yourself. Uh, I didn't take Bucky, for example, until my senior year. Uh, my, my freshman year, I wouldn't have thought much about him. My, uh, my freshman year, I spent most of my time in what they called the rat hole. And the rat hole was uh, the local bar uh, where the, the, the students uh, uh, gathered. And that's where I spent most of my time at the rat hole. And we had special days and everything we had. Oh, it's coming up soon uh, now. Uh, we would always gather there on, uh, on uh, December 7th uh, every year, even after we graduated. We made this pledge to come back every December 7th. We never did, but you know, we made that pledge that we, would do. we were full of ourselves at that time because we wanted to celebrate together one more time the Get Bomb for Pearl Harbor Day, which is what December 7th was, Pearl Harbor Day, the, the day that uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And we figured, well, we'll get bombed. 
and we did every December seventh. What did uh, what did Pro Harbor Day mean to you as a serviceman? To me, nothing. 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 That was uh, well to put it bluntly. That was my father's war. That wasn't mine. And uh, you know the uh, Korean War broke out in forty nine fifty, I think. Uh, so it was only about two or three years old when I went into service, and I had no notion of even wanting to go to Korea until the assignment came up. And I figured, well, this is only a short assignment, I can handle this, and went to Korea. But no, World War II, at Pearl Harbor, World War II, D-Day, that was all behind me. I was, uh, I was a kid uh, when that was going on. Uh, so it didn't, it didn't mean anything to me. Matter of fact, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's death meant more to me than, uh, than Pearl Harbor. That was, a, that was a sad day for me, that yeah, for a lot of people. But I never thought that I could, you know, I hadn't reacted to anybody's deaths um, before. And this was the first person that uh, who I, I thought I knew, uh, but he was only my president, so it wasn't really like knowing him. Um, but uh, I, I missed him, you know, because I was one of those people who listened to his fireside chats every Saturday, uh, and um, I admired him uh, for his uh, fight against polio and uh, and uh, I was one of those who thought, how in the world can a, a, a crippled man, I mean disabled, he couldn't stand up, um, be president of a country like ours? But he managed. I mean, he did it, uh, and he did it well. He didn't just slough it off. He had uh, a lot of courage. So he was a paternal sort of figure too. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, you could say that. So, do you think that do you think your sentiments shared a lot by a lot of the people of your generation that they Oh, I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. Um uh, all you have to do is uh you know, look at the history books about uh, uh Roosevelt's death. Uh, we didn't have television then, so there was no no television for these to to watch. But uh, we saw it in the movies, uh, the uh, Pathé News. Uh, we, we saw hordes of people just gathering around uh, the streets when the casket was pulled by horses down, the, uh, down Pennsylvania Avenue. And there were a lot of people who were not feeling good about that. They never, we never, figured Roosevelt would ever die. You know, we really knew, when we kids, we really had that idea. You know, that there's only one person who's going to be our president, Franklin Donald Roosevelt. He was going to be our president forever. Well, after he was elected to the presidency after the fourth time, he disappointed us. He died. What does Veterans Day mean to you? Hmm? What does Veterans Day mean to you? Oh, that, now Veterans Day is different. I, that means a lot. That means a lot. Because I am a veteran. I am a veteran of a war that was over before most of these uh, uh, people were born, you know, uh, around schools, uh, academic settings like this. So they have, they, I, I recognize, they have no idea what it's like to be in a war or to uh, be part of a war, uh, and especially this time. Now, with the, the Vietnam War, uh, and there was a draft. So every, every student, every male student that I taught back then in the 60s uh, had a number. And when the number came up, wherever they were, they were going into service, their draft number. So there was no escaping. Uh, the service if your name was called. Um, but now you don't 
you know, you don't have to go to Iraq unless you want to. So, I, I, I grew up in, uh, in a kind of wartime, not really a wartime. Uh, I was one of those people uh, who uh, was really pissed off at the students for rebelling uh, during the Vietnam War. You know, uh, thinking, you know, looking at these, whatever you might think about how right or wrong we are, uh, those Vietnamese are, are killing Americans. And so I was, I was pretty uh, patriotic in those days, and I saw things differently than I do now. The only thing I brought home from, the only thing I brought home from Korea uh, was a dislike for guns. And you can ask Nora, you know, I still have that dislike for guns of any kind. And my children have never had toy guns to play with because I won't allow it. And uh, Nora will uh, allow me that, a little prejudice. Uh, so we, you know, we're not, we're not amendment, uh, we're not amendment to uh, people at all in that respect. And I have not even had a gun near me uh, since that carbine, since that uh, uh, that M1 that I had in Korea. I just after that, uh, you know, I've just made up my mind that. Uh, Guns meant war, and wars are bad, so guns are bad. And it's a, it's a stubborn, in some ways, a stupid position uh, to take, but I think it's a position anyone would take, well, not anyone, uh, who is in a situation like mine, you know, and getting shot at. Uh, and I, do, I did some shooting. I have no idea if I killed anybody or even wounded anybody. You couldn't see. And there, was, there were no, it's not like the movies where you see them coming over a hill and you can see them distinctly enough that you can aim right at them, hit them in the head or the heart. No, it isn't that way at all. It's murky. It really is. It's murky. And, you, and yeah, at least the experience I had, uh, they invade at night when uh, they can't see you and and you can't see them and just hope for the best. So I associate, I still associate guns with war. How do you feel about the military today? How about what? About the military today. Like today's military? Oh. What do you think? Oh, today's military is different than the one I joined. The uh, training period, the basic training period, is even a lot shorter. Uh, they're, they're either doing it better quickly or not doing it as well. Um, and I have no idea which is which, um, but it could be you know, either way. But today we have uh, what in Washington they call a professional army. In other words, people are actually joining the Army and Navy and, and Marines and the Air Force to make a living. That makes them professional soldiers uh, and are, are willing to put up with the crap of being in military um, uh, for a, a regular paycheck. And that makes them professionals. Then uh, in, in Iraq, they uh, I'm sure those those soldiers will tell you well, I'm a professional soldier. Uh, and when you decide you're going to be a professional soldier, that means everything goes. You know that uh, if you get killed, you get killed. Uh, if you get maimed, you get maimed. Uh, if a car bomb goes off near you, and, and you get hurt, you know that that's part of that profession, being a soldier. Uh, it's like. Uh, you know, it's, it's like surgeons, you know, and part of their profession uh, is an operating room. And they could kill people on that operating table or maim them or do anything if they're incompetent. Uh, and it's the same way in the military. 
we never have gone, we've never gone to war against nice guys. That's the way I, I look at it anyway. We've never gone to war against nice guys. So, I know this is a, a big question, but what's your view on war? Just. That's my view on war. Yeah. There shouldn't be any. Not for any reason. They just shouldn't be anymore. It's, um, oh, and what we call a, uh, I'll remember it, uh, it's a uh, categorical imperative, uh, which means it's an absolute. And there should be no change, no waiver from that absolute, that there should not be wars. And which is why I'm so pissed off at Bush, because he actually started one. He invaded a different country. No, we'd never done that before. Um, and at, the, at that point, I didn't care if he was right or wrong. Uh, by invading another country, he was wrong, period, yeah, in my judgment. Uh, so I, I, I haven't liked him since. Uh, I'm glad he's getting out of there. But uh, no, that, that's, that's my view of the military and war now. You know, making them professional soldiers doesn't make them better soldiers, and uh, it doesn't make them any different than any other soldier that's ever fought for his country. You know, you, uh, you're still putting your life on the line. Uh, the worst thing that can happen to you is to get killed. Uh, and there, there are other professions like that. Uh, like steel workers, uh, the guys who walk the beams and skyscrapers, the worst thing that could happen to them is slip and fall and get killed, uh, falling off of a skyscraper. Well, that's like the military. You know, you get sent to the wrong place. At the beginning of the war, if you got sent to Iraq rather than Iran, uh, you felt pretty good. But now, you don't feel good no matter where you are. How did your military experience change your life? How did it change my life? Oh, in so many ways. Uh, when I went into service, I didn't smoke. Uh, within the first year, I was smoking like a chimney. Uh, before I went into service, I didn't drink coffee. And now I drink a pot a day. Uh, I mean, still, I don't smoke anymore, but I, I still drink a lot of coffee. Uh, and, and other things because, you know, those kinds of things are important in the military. You know, that uh, it's like letting off steam and some other jobs. You know, and part of your job is drinking coffee. Everybody drinks coffee uh, and eats pie if they have friends in the mess hall. And I, I, and I did. And when they were baking the pies, uh, uh, they would always give me a call if I was doing, doing uh, CQ. That's what it's called when you're overnight, you're the commander of the whole squadron. Uh, they would give me a call that uh, they made cherry pies. I love cherry pie. Uh, and uh, would you like us to send one over to Yale? And I say, I always say, yeah. <laughs> and then. Uh, I would eat it almost myself because at that time of the morning, like three o'clock in the morning, uh, there was nobody around anyway. So I'd make a pick of myself and sometimes I'd let Herb have some. But that, you know, it, it, it was, at the beginning it was more like a frolic about being in the military. You felt silly marching. You felt, felt silly singing the marching songs that you're supposed to be singing. Uh, but uh, it was okay because it was a silly time of your life. And the, the thing that got us into service was silly. Uh, so we just went along with it. 
Um, you mentioned her a couple of times. Are you still in touch with him? Is he yes, still? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, now that you mention it, uh, I just got his uh, annual Christmas card from Denver just yesterday in the mail. Uh, no, her, for some reason there was, there was some kind of connection between Herb and I uh, that just won't die. I mean, there were three other guys that we hung out with, and one's a monk in St. John's, uh, Minnesota. Uh, he actually is a monk. And before he became a monk, he had his, he, after service, he went back to college. He was from Chicago, but he went back to uh, college in, at Columbia uh, in what they call the Little Red Schoolhouse. Little Red Schoolhouse because it was uh, the, uh, uh, the dorm for all the Russian majors. And he was a Russian major. And uh, I haven't seen him. Last time I saw him, Herb and I visited him in the little red schoolhouse and spent an evening with him and I haven't seen Ed since. Uh, but uh, Herb has. Herb has. Matter of fact, the last time we saw Herb, uh, he told me that he'd, uh, he'd been with, uh, uh, with uh, our friend uh, uh, at uh, St. John's and told me he was a full-fledged monk. That sort of blew me away because he was one of those playful guys too. And uh, when people started talking about family and, and Ed's, um, Ed's, he would always talk about his mother. Uh, oh yeah, my mother is Bertha Gann and uh, she's a professional wrestler. She wasn't, of course, <laughs> and her name wasn't Bertha Gann because uh, Ed's last name was Andrews, not Gann. But he liked telling people that his mother was a, a professional wrestler. Um, what did Herb do after the military? Uh, well, when we got, we got separated uh, after uh, the first three years uh, because, um, like I told you, the, the basic training was changing. They didn't need us anymore, so I got sent to Scott and he got sent to Chinook. Chinute is uh, about 125 miles north of Scott the Air Force Base, and it's still in Illinois. Uh, and then when they closed down Chinute, they sent him to Lowry in, in Colorado. And the last time I saw him while we were both in service, uh, I was uh, on um, I was on on duty to go on a prisoner hunt. And it's not hunting down prisoners uh, or anything like that. Uh, it meant that, at this, on this occasion, it meant that some of the air police in, uh, in Colorado uh, discovered this guy who was AWOL, picked him up and jailed him. And since his base was our base, Scott, um, they would call Scott, Scott, and, and tell him, come pick him up. You know, he's your property. And I was one of the, they sent two people out for uh, this duty. But I was one of them, so we got a chance to go to, uh, to Colorado, to Denver, um, and uh, pick up this prisoner. And while I was there, we spent a couple of extra days. Uh, Herb regaled me at his favorite barbecue joint, Georgia Boy. Uh, and we did some drinking together and some reminiscing together, and that's the last time I saw him when we were in service. Uh, and the next time I heard from him, uh, he was studying for the law uh, in D.C. at American University. And I thought that was kind of strange because uh, he had already finished the degree. He was a bachelor, bachelor of science. He was in chemistry. Uh, and he didn't want to teach, so he decided he'd become a lawyer, a patent lawyer, because he knew chemistry and things, and that worked out well for him. Wow, that's cool. And um, you've uh, 
Did anyone else in your family? Mm -hmm. Did anyone else in your family serve in the military? No. 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 My my mother didn't, and my father was drafted, but uh, labeled 4F, which meant that he was uh, physically uh, disabled um, and couldn't couldn't serve in the military. Um, and that pissed him off. I can't believe it, you know, how, how much we've changed as a people. Um, my dad was incensed that, uh, that he wasn't allowed to uh, be in the military um, because he, he felt in his heart that, you know, he, he should be in there fighting. Well, my dad was a boxer, so, you know, fighting was natural for him. But it was, you know, in retrospect that that always got me that he was pissed off because he couldn't go serve uh, his country and risk his life. Uh, his friend did and came home with a fake leg. And my mother was quick to point out, now, that's one reason I'm, th I'm thankful that it didn't take you. You know, it's not you with that. I wouldn't like. Um, what message would you give to the servicemen of today? The servicemen? And women of today. Okay. Not, not the young people here, because I'm not telling anybody to go join. But I'm not going to tell any person who's already joined to quit. You know, uh, that would be dishonest of me to, uh, to do that because I am, like I said, I am patriotic to a point. And if, uh, there, if there's a reason that led you to joining the uh, professional army uh, or the professional air force, then you should probably stay with it. Um, because there is, uh, you know, I, I became a teacher uh, for my reasons. Uh, he became whoever he is. He became a soldier because he, so I'm not going to tell him to quit. I'm not even going to tell him he's doing the wrong thing, even though I'm going to think that. You know, that, uh, you know, you leave yourself open when you join service. You're leaving yourself open to the whims and fancy of a, um, uh, of a president and, and his staff. You know, and it's they uh, who can stop wars and start wars. Uh, I didn't used to think that way, but uh, since uh, Bush got in office, uh, I, I have. You know, like I said, he's, as far as I know, he's the first president to start a war. And I don't, I don't think he should have done that. So what message would you give to young people? Um, any other than uh, don't join? But Well, no, it, it would be more like uh, don't join unless you really think you're a warrior. You know, uh, because it's not what you think it is. There is nothing romantic about it. There is nothing glamorous about it. There is nothing that's super fun about it, at least not anymore. Uh, you know, it's going to be like any other job that you, you could take. Uh, you will be a professional soldier, and so you're going to prepare yourself for war or for defense. Uh, and that's, that's what your job is, to defend people like me, uh, either overseas or here. So you think about what you're doing before you get into service. Can you hack that lifestyle? And it's not just a matter of living in barracks. It's not just a matter of going through basics, basic uh, training. It's a matter of uh, living by somebody else's rules, uh, whether they make sense or not. Um, and you know, where else? Where else in, in this whole country can you be thrown in jail for not showing up at work?
military. The military, you're officially AWOL, A-W-O-L, absent without leave. And that's a criminal offense. A criminal offense that isn't taken care of with a simple Article 15 punishment. Uh, it's, it, it's a courts martial offense. You go and you're, you're courts martialed, uh, either a summary or a general courts martial. The general is more severe. But, you know, that's, that's the kind of law they have. Uh, I, I, I don't feel like going to work today. You know, that, that wouldn't get you for that, because if you didn't feel like going to work, you'd probably still in the, in the dorm. As long as you're not off post, that's fine. But, you know, I think I'll take a trip down to Miami. You know, then, then you're AWOL, because you're nowhere near your duty station. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us or reflect on? Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, I could talk a lot about the 60s. That was a terrible time uh, for, for people like me, because uh, I was ambivalent uh, about it, because having been in the military and then seeing the dis disrespect that these young snots were having for people in the military. And at that time, I, I was really pissed off at students. You know, who dared? Who dared? They, they would do anything to keep from going to war. And then those who would, uh, they're bad guys. They're bad guys because they're fighting in Vietnam uh, against uh, uh, a part of the country that wants to uh, have all of the country. And it's not our business, uh, except that Johnson uh, said that, uh, you know, that this is part of the domino theory, or the domino effect. You know, if Saigon falls, then what's next? You know, all the islands are going to fall, and it didn't happen. So Lyndon Johnson was wrong. A whole lot of people had to die to figure that out. Yeah. Dad. Yeah. Mom says she's on her way down. Okay. Uh, I better open the door, huh? Okay. Well. Um, did you want to continue, or what? Did you want to keep going, or are you no. all set? Okay. Well, thank you for um, doing this interview with us. So. Sorry.